one. This one happened earlier this week. There's a lot of crazy things about the place I work, but this is the most noteworthy happening. And it was a situational catalyst for me to successfully, thank God, seek a new job. It was a hot afternoon. The air conditioning hadn't been functioning all day, and most everyone was sitting outside on the patio. The lights were dimmed in the bar and dining room, so it was a very subtle shift when a row of lights went out, and the backup floodlight on a single emergency exit sign lit up. I thought it was strange, but didn't really think anything of it until the music went out, and shortly after, the computer terminals. With no internet and an apparent partial outage, management arrived at a reasonable conclusion. A breaker had overloaded and needed to be reset. So they went in search of the breaker box. It is unlabeled, and nothing seems to be tripped. Maybe there's another breaker box, someone said cautiously. A statement that is all concerning on its own, but when the owners and managers of the restaurant are saying it, you realize this isn't going to end well. The terminal is still offline, despite a hard reset from the server. So I'm scrambling at this point, preparing bills in offline mode to get finished customers out the door, and printing tickets myself to run back to the kitchen. I advise a couple that we're having some internet difficulties, and offer to run their card in a few minutes when we're back online. They decided to pay cash instead. In one of my trips to the kitchen, I see someone has found the mythic second breaker box, and they're methodically flipping each breaker off then on. I assume they're doing this in the primary breaker as well. Within five minutes of this, the kitchen and the bar are filled with smoke. Turns out, in the fucking around of the breakers, they turned off the hood fans in the kitchen, and can't get them turned back on. People are scrambling to get fans in windows, and one owner is saying something to the effect of, Why are you letting it get so smoky in here? The kitchen puts a moratorium on hot orders, and rushes out the orders they already have, and the whole place goes into crisis mode. Tables aren't being turned away at the door, but between the smoke-filled bar and the disclaimer that we can't do any hot food, we can make you a salad or a pizza from our wood-fired oven, people aren't too keen on staying. Meanwhile, the family of six has no way to pay their bill with the terminal still not processing cards. My manager worked it out somehow. For six dollars an hour, I don't worry about things like that. My other tables all pay cash and are on their merry way. Eventually, the kitchen regroups. There are two parties of two guests each in the restaurant at this point. They can't get the hood fans or the internet on to save their lives, and the emergency floodlights are still on the singular exit sign. The dishwashers in the kitchen and the bar aren't working either. They're going to soldier on, cooking burgers in the wood oven with the pizzas, and with salads and soups. I guess they planned to cross the dishes bridge when they got there. I, for the life of me, can't fathom why you wouldn't want to get customers out and a repairman in as soon as possible. But I guess that's why they own the restaurant and I don't. I overhear at least two or three more parties arrive. One is okay with the limited menu, but the others turn and leave. They wanted steak and seafood, not our mediocre at best pizzas. There were two saving graces of all this. The first was that I was the first in that shift, so I went home early. The second was that the previously broken central air was now kicked on at full force. At least the place will be cooler than outside when I do my final shift tomorrow. 2. So to address all of the characters of this story, let's begin the typical listings. None of their real names are provided. Crazy Lady, CL, Manager, Chi, my two fellow co-workers, Winnie and Quinn. And here are the words I will be using, which may be confusing, unless you know what I'm specifically referring to. Back window. Essentially a drive through but you order and receive food at our single window in the back of the diner. Noon special. An eighth pound patty burger, fries and small drink, which is also pretty cheap. Now surprisingly, the craziest customer I've ever interacted with wasn't even at my fast food service job. Nope. It happened a few days ago at the diner that I currently work at. This diner specifically, I would say, is a bit more on the expensive side compared to most local shops you would find. Now, this whole situation all starts out when the chime for the back window rings out twice. Quinn goes to the back to take both of their orders, which is when he first meets CL, an old woman with bright red dyed hair. 
When taking her order, she repeatedly tells him about her husband that had just passed away this week, and how she was very distraught about it, as you would be. Essentially, she orders a noon special, specifically asking for our smallest burger, adding mushrooms on it with a side of onion rings. For our diner, though, onion rings cost extra, and adding something onto a burger also costs extra. This is an important note for a little later in the story. Eventually, my co-worker Winnie ends up back there and decides to make sure Ciel has been helped. This opened a door for Ciel to rant. She started talking about how she's had her husband pass away this week, how upset she was, how she lives in town. And most disturbingly, she tells Winnie about how good her son's package is. Yeah. Thankfully, Winnie heard the door chime go off and excused herself to go take care of another customer. Now in comes me, completely unaware of what's been happening. Her order had been finished and I grabbed it and went to the back to deliver it to her. Have any of you ever felt off looking at someone? Like there was something wrong going on? Because that's exactly what I felt. She takes the order from me, and then promptly asks for her receipt. I figured this would be a case of someone believing they were overcharged and reluctantly agreed. However, she refused to take the receipt, so I just decided to recite it to her. You had a noon special and added mushrooms onto it with onion rings and a Pepsi, correct? Well, yes, but I was hoping you guys could give me a break. My husband just passed away today. I was a little confused at first, but realized she wanted a discount. But before even responding to her, she continues. That man that took my order said he'd give me a break since my husband passed away today. My husband and I always came here. I wanted to come here to remember him. I just want a break. Luckily for me, Quinn was already in the back with me, so I asked him if he gave her a discount. He told me no, and that she had never even asked for one. It wouldn't have even mattered really, though, since she already paid her original price. So I went back to the window and essentially said, I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to give a discount to you. I don't really get to control that kind of thing. Again, I'm really sorry. She tells me she doesn't blame me and that it's okay, and then randomly asks if we have new ownership over the building. I wasn't too sure, so I told her maybe. She came to the conclusion after I said that, that there were new owners because the old ones wouldn't do that to her. Eventually I walked away, apologizing again, and moved on. So a bit of a time skip here, about an hour long one. Quinn goes to take the garbage out when CL gets out to her car, stops him, and begins to talk to him. Eventually this leads to her crying to him about her husband passing away. Obviously, no one at a diner is really equipped to handle emotional distress, so my manager, Chi, decided to talk to her and sends Quinn inside. They were out there for about 45 minutes before Chi came back in. She had hives all over her arms and was crying. She had been so stressed and scared dealing with CL, thinking she might get held at gunpoint or something, that she started to break out. Now, what did she say and do exactly? Well, let's see is crying over her husband, and then the conversation somehow morphs to how she shops at Petco and Fred Mayer. How she used to live in Roseburg, Oregon. She now lives in a town 45 minutes away, even though she told Quinn and Winnie that she lived in town, etc. And then it turns into getting a break again. How she wants a break because her husband passed away. And then when she realizes she isn't getting a discount, Starts saying how our 8th pound patty is too small, and claims that we went to McDonald's, bought a burger there, cut it in half, and then gave it to her. She then takes the patty and throws it at Chi. CL is now screaming at her while saying she's the shittiest person she's ever met, a terrible waitress, and a whole bunch of other stuff I can't remember. Now Chi is crying and saying that she's sorry, and she doesn't know what to say, do, or how to help. CL then grabs her wrist and left cheek, pulls her in and kisses her other cheek. She then says that she doesn't want Chi to go home and thinks she's bad at her job because of what she said. And then she drops not one, but two major bombshells. CL tells her how similar her dead husband and son were, then immediately follows it up with gloating about how good her son's package is. Uh, yeah. And then, at some point, she says her husband died three and a half years ago. Not today, not this week, three and a half years ago. So I don't know why this lady acted like this. 
but please never ever do this to any server you come across. 3. Disclaimer. I am not completely blaming Karen or the party in the story. I get that we as a restaurant messed up too, and that their anger did not come out of nowhere. But damn girl, calm the F down. I serve at a small staff, upscalish local farm to table type place that hasn't decided if it's fine dining or just nicer than casual. We're usually not super busy because our prices are high. We have a $45 steak, for example. We also sell a lot of $100 plus wines. But this last Friday, we apparently angered the hospitality gods and they decided to smite us. We changed the menu on a Friday of all days to combine the bar and dining room menus, add some weekly specials, cut what wasn't selling, and drop the price points, hoping this will bring more people in. Some small changes like now all dishes have a soup or salad included, etc. We also added a lot of fried items, even though our kitchen is only running on one fryer at the moment. We're fully staffed for what we hope will be a busy night. One hostess, three servers, including me, two bartenders, a food runner and bar back, full kitchen staff. Let's just say we were not prepared at all. The night starts out pretty slow for the dining room, but the bar gets hit hard. 6.30 rolls around, and turns out six of our eight reservations are scheduled for that time. So all the servers immediately get double sat. Then the bar gets overwhelmed, so the servers start taking over the patio tables as well as their own sections. There's no system. It's pretty much chaos. Now the bar is already struggling to get their drinks and our drinks made. When the 14 top birthday party we've been expecting comes in and is seated in a private room adjacent to the bar. They are split up into two groups of seven and each bartender takes one table. They pretty much run independently of each other, which I don't think is a great idea, but hey, it's not my table. Note, this next bit is just what I was able to piece together afterward. I was in the dining room, so didn't witness much of it. They order a ton of drinks, a pricey bottle of wine, and the whole party gets wasted pretty quickly. One table orders a bunch of appetizers, no entrees, and they are put in immediately. The other table is talking and hasn't even looked at the menu, let alone decided on food. The second table finally decides to order after the first table gets their appetizers. They all order our fresh fish special. Easy enough except we're already behind on fried stuff because one of our two friars is in need of a new part. So the food takes a bit longer than it should. All of the food, actually. I spent my entire shift comping drinks and food and giving free desserts and apologizing about the delay. It should be noted at this point that I had a table wait over 30 minutes on a margarita. Walking up to the bar at that point was a no-no because all that would happen was you'd get snapped at or waved away. The bartenders had basically given up on making drinks for the dining room because they were so slammed at the bar. My drinks only got made after I mentioned to the owner that I was waiting on a bunch of cocktails. And this is where shit really hit the fan. Everything is pretty much halted in the kitchen while they're plating this Seven Tops food. As this is happening, the official Karen of the party has decided they've had enough waiting. I walk by and overhear her berating the bartender who was serving the other table because they've waited over an hour for their food. They hadn't. They just didn't order until after the other table had already gotten their food. This woman was pissed. Apparently at one point the hostess came around to ask if she could clear the plates and stuff off their tables to lighten the bartender's load. And the Karen told her to, and I quote, Take this plate and shove it up your ass. It wasn't long before she stormed her way into the kitchen where the chef is getting their food ready to run. I'm paraphrasing. This is absolutely ridiculous. The other table got their food an hour ago. Why haven't we been served? I'm sorry for your wait, ma'am. We have your food right here. We can have it out for you right now. You better have it out right now, or we won't be paying for anything. The food, the wine, nothing. I can't believe you would serve one table and not the other. Ma'am, I can't bring the food out if you're going to refuse to pay. Are you insane? Do you want to be on Facebook? Do you want to be on social media? I thought the chef was being polite given the situation and how he was being talked to. 
I definitely would have been less friendly, but she was angry at the chef for being argumentative and stood in the hallway in plain earshot of other guests loudly arguing the situation with the owner, who was doing what he could to try and appease her. But there wasn't really anything else to be done. They didn't end up getting the food, so they didn't pay for it. And the rest of my food was crazy late because of all this madness. They did pay for the wine, which they did drink. And as they were leaving, a few of them threw their wine glasses on the ground and shattered them, leaving the bar back and bartenders to clean up all the broken glass. Overall, it was just an awful night. Staff was at each other's throats. I missed out on a ton of tips from Comp to Food. And I felt bad that I wasn't able to give excellent service to my tables because of how slow the food and drinks were coming out. The whole staff left late, exhausted and angry. The next day, there was a one-star review for our restaurant on TripAdvisor, written by Karen's husband, possibly. Might have been another one on Yelp, not sure. The guy who wrote it took the time to call us and let us know that if we were still open in six months, he'll take it down. Classy. 4. In 1984, I was a freshman in college. I lived in a tourist town on the East Coast, a popular destination for families making day trips from Baltimore or Washington, D.C. The restaurant where I worked was located in an old American-tile establishment with massive windows that looked out over the water, and it was popular with young families because of the relaxed atmosphere and the distraction of the view. The food was good, the service was friendly, and the prices were reasonable. The place did a nice business. I began as a hostess and segued to the floor after about six months. Started out on waiting tables at lunch, and then, after a few weeks, I got my first real dinner shift. A Friday night on one of the busiest weekends of the year, I was psyched. Everything was going just great until about eight. That was when a party of fourteen took over my station and stayed until ten. Normally this would have been an awesome thing, but only six of the fourteen were over the age of five. The three couples were in their middle twenties, and between them and their offspring, I was a mess by the end of the night. They spilled things, changed diapers at the table, let their kids throw stuff, scream, complained about the food, the drinks. It truly was a nightmare. I soldiered on, though, helped by a few co-workers until they asked for the check. I have a hazy memory that it was over a hundred dollars, which was a lot for the time. And honestly, the thought of that gratuity was just about the only thing that kept me going. They piled cash onto the tray, handed it to me, and started to pack up their kids. I went back and sorted the bills and discovered they tipped me less than three dollars. Assholes. I couldn't even manage a fake smile for them after that. Once they were gone, I grabbed the tray and got started on the unbelievable mess they made. The boss boy came over to help and took the dirty plates, cutlery, and other trash away. I started to pull the tables back into position, hoping to be seated again before we closed. I'm cursing those cheap assholes under my breath the entire time as I sweep up yet another pile of Cheerios or use a knife to scrape smashed french fries out of the carpet. That's when I see it. A 35mm film canister underneath one of the chairs. Back in the old days, you needed to put film into a camera in order to get pictures out of it. Film came in light-proof plastic canisters, and when you finished a roll, you put it back into the canister, ready to be processed. They were about two inches tall and one inch in diameter, with a plastic lid that created an airtight seal. I remember seeing several cameras in their possession, and I'd heard them talking about all the things they'd been doing that day. All the pictures they'd taken. If they hadn't stiffed me and pissed me off so badly, I would have taken it to the hostess stand immediately, but as it was... I picked up that cartridge and started fantasizing about exposing their film. I wanted vengeance. I wanted to ruin their pictures the way they'd ruined my night. I wouldn't have done it. But I thought about it. And then I shook the canister. I should have heard the plastic spindle that held the used film clanking back and forth. But there was nothing. Yet it clearly wasn't empty. I retreated to an empty banquet room and pried off the lid. Got one good look at what was inside. And then I heard a bit of commotion out on the dining floor. I closed the canister, put it in my pocket, and went to see what was the matter. Lo and behold, two of the men from my party had returned. They were questioning the busboy, and then they saw me. One of them came over while the other started crawling around the floor near their former table. They wanted to know if I had found anything at their table. 
he started claiming they'd lost a baby toy, and then added that it seemed as if they'd lost a roll of film. I shrugged. Nope, I don't know anything. Didn't see anything, sorry. Maybe you should ask the hostess if someone turned them in. The guy crawling on the floor admitted defeat, and the two exchanged glances before turning to leave. I made sure to tell them that I hoped they'd enjoy the rest of their weekend, in a very chipper and perky tone. I saw them both stutter to a halt and turn to look at me. I gave them a cheerful wave and a smile. That's when they knew. I watched them go down the stairs, crushed, defeated, helpless. In 1984, a customer could not call management or the police to complain that his waitress had kept the container of dense, dank, and unbelievably powerful weed that he'd lost underneath the restaurant table. The stuff was packed into that container so tightly that it had to be extracted with tweezers. It was purple, coated in crystals, and it took me nearly six months to smoke all of it. Even with the help of my friends. Probably cost those guys a fortune. Much more than the 15% they should have left me. Best tip I've ever gotten in my life. 5. So the place I used to work at was a very dated restaurant in a small town in the UK. It's now undergone extensive renovations and is a much nicer establishment now but back then it was just a cheap and cheerful pub grub type place. On the day in question, it was very quiet, so there was just me front of house. I had a family of four come in, and the layout of the restaurant was such that, from the bar and point of sale area, all tables were in clear view. The family had all ordered food, adults ordered two coffees, and the kids ordered a hot chocolate each. I personally can't get on board with a hot chocolate with lunch, but that's just me. Anyway... I rang in their order, served their hot drinks, and as it was a chef de ping kind of establishment back then, served their food fairly quickly. I checked that everything was okay with their meals, no complaints. But I did notice that the kids hadn't touched their hot chocolates, assuming that they had ordered them to drink after their meal, mainly because this is something I would do. As I say, hot chocolate alongside food just doesn't sit right with me. I went back to the bar area to, well, wait around. Day shifts at this place were fairly dull. Towards the end of their meal, they were actually the only table in. This is important to note, as I wasn't running around like a crazy person dealing with other tables. I wasn't even busy. I was within clear eyesight of this family the entire time, except when I went into the kitchen to get their food. After they were done eating, I cleared their plates, asked if they wanted anything else, they didn't, and took them the bill, indicating that they would need to pay at the point of sale by the bar. They had been in for around an hour at this point. Mum came to the bar with her purse out, started getting ready to pay, and throws me a curveball. The hot chocolates were cold! So I replied, oh, I'm very sorry about that, would you like me to remake them? Now, I don't know about other places that make hot drinks, but at this place we had thermometers for the milk jugs, so that everything was made to the correct temperature. Even if it is made to temperature, it's highly unlikely that if you leave a hot drink out for an hour, it's going to retain all of its heat. Mum tells me that no, they wouldn't like them remaking. The kids have drank them and they need to leave now. Again, I apologize to her, but explain that at this point there's not much I can do. Mum doesn't like this. She asks me to just remove them from the bill. This is where I have to explain. Ma'am, if you had told me when the drinks arrived at the table that they were not the correct temperature, I would have been able to fix that for you. If your kids had opted to leave their drink until after the meal, and you had informed me at that point that the drinks were cold, I would, again, have been able to do something about this. The fact that you waited not only until you were paying, but until after your kids finished both hot chocolates, gives me no option but to charge you for items consumed. She wasn't happy, but she did pay. But it never fails to frustrate me that these people wait until the end of their meal when they're getting ready to pay to let their server know that there's an issue. Like, dude, I've visited your table three times. I was right over there by the point of sale for your entire meal. I haven't been hiding from you. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Spinning Plates, episode 56. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. I hear rumblings from neighbors in the distance. Trying to get done recording before they decide to have a party or something. See, it is a wee bit sunny today. It was sunny yesterday as well, so the weather's been quite pleasant. 
Um, hot, but not unbearably hot, so it's been quite nice. But I'd imagine that would be barbecue weather for them, so I should probably get my butt in gear and get the audio recorded. Which should actually mean I get done a little bit early myself, in theory. Hmm, there may be streaming. I guess we'll find out, because this is Friday as I'm recording this. Okay, and with that I'm going to head off for now, so until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.